and hopefully be saved just like we are. Right now, our church is going through some trying times, we're, but we're coming out of it. We're, we're getting better and better each week. We're going to know more about what's going on in our lives and everything. It's going to pull, pull us together more. We will go as a church and be a church from now on. Um, <coughs> Brother Jim, do you mind leaving us a word of prayer? Daily, Father, Lord, once again, it's, uh, we have the honor and the privilege to come into your presence, Father. We just give thanks for the blessings of the day, Lord. We give thanks for the opportunity that we can come together and fellowship in your house and listen to the word, where we can honor you in word and in song, Father. We give thanks for the blessings that uh, we've got visitors this morning that have are devoting their time to come and, and listen to what your message has to say, Father. So we are blessed in many, many ways. We are blessed by the fact that your son thought that we were worthy enough to, to give his life on the cross, Father. That is a blessing that, that we'll never be able to repay. There's no way in the world that we could ever come close to it, Father. Here again, your son did not want repayment in that regard. Father, your son wanted to have obedience and faith to the Father. Once we accepted your son as our Lord and Savior, Father, we signed a contract, we made an agreement that said we would be obedient, we would be faithful. And in doing so, Father, I think that in most cases we break that, that contract on a daily basis. But here again, you and your son realized that they were dealing with humans, and humans have faults. That's not an excuse. It's just the weakness that we have, Father. And we just give thanks again for the, for the sacrifice your son made on the cross, not only for us, but for all sinners that were, will be, yet to come, Father. We come to you this morning as sinners, asking for forgiveness. Where we fail, you ask him forgiveness of our sins. We ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. David, we've got about most any of y'all remember Shelly Bird? Who? Mm -hmm. Shelly Bird. She frequented here when she lived here in Taylor. Her brother, Brian Bird, she just messaged me this morning, has been missing since Thursday, and unfortunately he has some mental health issues. Um, and they fear that he has gone somewhere and likely committed suicide. They're looking for him. They don't know where. He told them he'd go somewhere, but not always find him. So we need prayer for that family. His mom lives here. He lives here. Shelly's unfortunately south of San Antonio with a brother-in-law who is on hospice, and she can't leave to come home to help look for him. So Kenneth is out right now looking for his truck to see if he can find him. Okay. We will keep him in our prayers. We'll give him on our prayer list for sure. <coughs> You'll take the hymnal, please, and turn to number 548. 548. All three verses.
all three verses stand on the third verse for the three gospels. souls in our community and in the world. Let us plant a seed so we can grow your kingdom. We want to pray for our, our law enforcement, our medical personnel that couldn't be in the churches to worship. Yeah. We're thankful for your son's sacrifice on the cross and forgiveness of our sins. We ask for forgiveness for what we've had in our shortcomings. We ask for forgiveness of our sin as we forgive others. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
house this morning. Appreciate you guys for allowing me to come and be part of this. If you have a Bible, we're going to be reading from the book of Revelations, chapter number, chapter 3. Revelation number 3. Always good to be in God's house with his people. I came in and saw the pulpit moved over and the first thing that came to mind was we had switched over to a liturgical church, this being the gospel side and this the epistle side. So we're preaching the gospel this morning. Should, maybe I should preach from the, this side of the church. But no, I'm joking. I like small stand like this. Revelation chapter 3. If you have found your place and this thing don't fall off of me. I'll ask you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. A very familiar passage of Scripture to you, no doubt. Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse number 14. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans tried, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich 
and increased with goods that had need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness not, do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in the throne in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Let's go over now to the word of prayer. Father, we are truly grateful that you have once again allowed us this privilege of being able to come to your house to gather with your people around your word. And Father, we pray that you would use your own word to speak to our hearts. Father, we pray that we would be encouraged this morning to go out and to live a life that's pleasing to you. And Father, we also pray if the need be for conviction. Father, we pray for that reprovement from you that we might be corrected and that we again may bring honor and glory to you. Father, we pray that you would forgive us our sins. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. We pray for a mission, uh, West Side Missionary Baptist Church and ask God for your guidance, for your direction for them. Father, just be with us this morning. Lead and guide us in everything that we say and do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before we get started, I want to draw your attention to the very last verse that we read this morning in verse number 22. The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If you was to go back and read chapters 2 and 3 together, you would find that here we are, as recorded for us, seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. And at the end of every single letter, we find the same thing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What I want to emphasize this morning is that the Spirit has something to say to the churches. Seven times we read the Spirit has something to say. So it behooves us as a church of God to sit up and pay attention to what the Spirit has to say. It's very important some things that the Spirit has to say to us. And of the seven churches, the seven letters to these churches, I believe that the letter that we've read this morning is the most important for the 20th century church of our day. I believe that we fall into this category. I believe that every single church almost uh, could take down the signs out in front of the church and put the sign up, the church of the Laodiceans, because I believe that we fit the bill for the majority, for the most part. This church, this letter is to us as a 21st century church. And so as we begin to go through it, I want us to see some things. First off, I want us to see that the church of the Laodicean, the, uh, the city of Laodicean, was known for three principal things. It was known for its banking institutions. It was known for uh, its uh, manufacture of wool, its raiment. It was also renowned for its medical school. Uh, and uh, specifically, the medical school was known for their eyesight that they were selling to, uh, to try to help people's sight. And this thing is going to be on my nerves a whole morning, I think. It, my ear must be afflicted. Take it out. Take it out. There we go. You can hear me, right? Yep. That's what I like right there. Here we go. That thing flew around, fall off my ear, caused me to trip and fall down. Three things the church was known for, and all three things, the Lord, or the Spirit of the Lord, identifies all of them and speaks to them uh, in that regard. If you was uh, one that study, had study Bibles and things, I've got, I uh, don't tell you how many, probably four or five bookshelves full of different study Bibles and things. The King James Version Study Bible says of the Church of Laodicea, or the name Laodicea, that it was actually, it means the people's ruin. 
of the church. And I believe that that's what we find a lot of this morning uh, in the 21st church, is that the church is being ruled by people instead of the Lord. And as, uh, as such, we find ourselves uh, in dire need or desperate need this morning as a 21st century church. And so uh, I, and I believe it's good for us to spend some time with this letter and see uh, some things that the Lord has to say to us as a church. Three things I want to share with you from the passage that we've read this morning. I want us to see, first of all, the condemnation that the Lord gives uh, to the church. And then we're going to see the counsel that the Lord gives to the church. And then lastly, we'll look at the promise that God or that Jesus gives to the church. So those three, three things we're going to be dealing with. If you're the one to take notes, you can write down, write down those three points. And you can be done with the sermon this morning. You can probably go on about your merry way. Uh, because that's, that's I gave you the whole thing all up front. So uh, uh, that, that's good. So when it comes to 12 o'clock, you can go ahead and leave anyway. Uh, those of us who are still here too can get the rest of the sermon. Let's begin looking at what the Spirit said under the churches. First off, let's consider the condemnation. Again, let's read verses 15 through 17 because we're going to be talking about this passage of Scripture concerning the condemnation that Jesus has given to the church of Laodicea. Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, Jesus says. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What a condemnation. This is one of the churches that Jesus has nothing good to say about whatsoever. Nothing good to say. He condemns them. He does not build them up. He don't say, well, you've done this right and you've done that right. No, Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, this is what you've done wrong. Well, what is it about the church of Laodicea that is so wrong that Jesus says, I would just as soon vomit you out of my mouth than to have anything to do with you? What is it about this particular church that has upset Jesus so much? Well, let's see what it is. First off, they were lukewarm. They were lukewarm. This word speaks of a state of complacency and indifference. The word describes much of the religious world that you and I live in today. For the most part, Christians of our day are only half-hearted, half-committed people who think they are something when in reality they are not. They are all lukewarm. The city of Laodicea did not have their own water supply. They had water piped in from two, ne two neighboring cities. One of them, Hot Springs, in a nearby uh, city, was being piped into Laodicea. But by the time that it got to Laodicea, the, the water was no longer hot anymore, did not have that therapeutic uh, properties to it anymore, but it was lukewarm. The same with the other side. They had cold water piped in from another city, but by the time that cold water reached Laodicea, it had already become lukewarm again. And anyone who was not... Uh, custom to that lukewarm water when visitors would come to land and see it, they would drink the water and they would just spew it out of their mouth because it was lukewarm. Nobody likes lukewarm water. Well, that's what Jesus is likening the church of Laodicea to. You have become lukewarm. You're not cold. You're not hot. You're not therapeutic to anyone. You're not refreshing to anybody. You are stagnant. You are complacent. You are lethargic. You are comfortable in doing the same old thing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You don't do anything new. In fact, you know, if it's outside, if it's not written in the bulletin, you can't do it. I heard one preacher say one time in his prayer that he just wished to God that he would do something that was not in the bulletin. <laughs> Jesus says you are lukewarm. You, are, you have grown so accustomed in your own ways that you no longer can follow my spirit, my leadership anymore, and I would just as soon spew thee out of my mouth. What strong language Jesus gives to the church of Laodicea when Jesus says to the church, you make me sick at my stomach. You're not warm. You're not, you're not hot. You're not on fire for me. You're not cold. You're not going out and refreshing people. You're neither of the two. You're lukewarm. You have grown stack. And so Jesus condemns the church of Laodicea. Notice something else in this condemnation. The false sense of security. 
The church had a false sense of security as they felt they were rich and increased with goods, but the reality of the situation was that they were wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. This was a church that because of their banking institutions, they had built up a big bank account. And the church of Laodicea was one that would walk around and say, well, you know what? We are the church that everybody ought to want to be a member of because we've got it going on. We don't need anything. We've got a big bank account. We can have anything that we want. We can do any kind of program that we want because we're financially stable. We can institute it. We can buy all the material that we need. We can get bands to come in. We can even entertain people. The Church of Laodicea was probably one because of their banking institution, because of their wealth. They had these bands come in. They had the live shows. They had the big orchestras. They had, and I'm not condemning any of this, but when the church is produced and entertaining someone, when well, the church has a problem. Laodicea obviously had a problem because Christ condemned them. The church said, well, we are rich and increased with goods and we don't need anything. Jesus says, you don't even know that you are poor, rich, miserable, blind, and naked. Reminds me of an individual in the Old Testament. You probably remember his name if I call it. He was one who had long locks of hair like myself. He had a girlfriend by the name of Delilah. And Delilah would come and she would try to capture Samson for the Philistines. And every time she'd ask Samson what his weakness was, Samson would give her a long line of yarn. You know how men do. But she just kept on and on and finally she just bore him down. Finally he said, okay, for the love of everything that's holy, I'll finally, I'll, I'll tell you if you just leave me alone. And he said, there's never been a razor come up on my head. I've never, I've never done this. <laughs> Delilah said, okay. So she begins running her fingers through his long hair. And I tell you, it's, I don't know if it's all of us men, but the majority of us, we just like, about like a dog. Or I know I am. You start petting my head and I go sound asleep. <laughs> That's what happened to Samson. He goes to sleep, and so she calls for the Philistines, and she says, Samson, the Philistines be upon you. And do you remember what the Bible says? Samson jumps up, and he says, well, I'll go out, and I'll shake myself as I have at other times, and I'll deliver myself to the Philistines. But the Bible says he did not even know that the Lord had departed from him. He had lived his life in such a way that the Spirit of God was no longer upon him. There was times when Samson killed a, a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. I, he, he caught 300 fox, tied their tails together, set them on fire, and running through somebody's cornfield. He, he could do pretty much anything. I don't know if you've ever been fox hunting. That thing's a pretty smart, hard to catch. He caught 300 of them. But now, after having sacrificed all the loyalties to God, at the end of his life, he had no earthly idea that the Lord had departed from him. He was so used to the Lord just showing up and being, being merciful to him and just answering his prayers. And he just woke up and said, well, it's not going to be any different today. God's with me. He's going to deliver me. And he had no earthly idea that God was nowhere to be found. The same thing can be said of churches today. Churches can come to Come together on Sunday morning and say, this is going to be just like any other service. We have need of nothing. We're rich and increased with goods. And Jesus says, you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. You have no idea that my spirit is not even in those four walls because you've been doing things your own way for so long. I believe that many churches have a false sense of security. Are we aware that the Lord is present here with us this morning? Or are we aware that the Spirit of the Lord has not been meeting with us? I mean, are we spiritually in tune to the Spirit of the Lord to know if He's here or not? Many churches are not. And as a result, Jesus said, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. The Greek word translated spew means literally to vomit or to throw up. A lukewarm church or a lukewarm Christian makes Jesus Seek to his stomach. What a graphic way of saying that he is not pleased with a half-hearted church. 
church of Laodicea was this kind of church that upset Jesus. And I wonder how many of us today, how many churches today are in the same predicament, the same condition that we made Jesus seek to his stone because we are so complacent. We are so lethargic. We are so used to doing our own thing that we don't even know that the Spirit of God is not even moving. He condemns the church. Let us notice the counsel that Jesus has given to the church. He has condemned them. He says, hey, you need to wake up and pay attention. He that had an ear, let him hear what I'm saying to the church. I have this against you. You are lethargic. You are lukewarm. But I've got the counsel for you. I've got the remedy for you. If you will hear what I have to say, I've got the directions that you need to rectify the situation. I can tell you how to overcome being lukewarm and come back into the fellowship with me. And here's a counsel that he gives us. Look in verse 18. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raven, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. The three things that the city of Laodicea was known for was their banking institutions, their, their regiment, their wool manufacturers, and their medical school. All three of those Jesus brings into his council here. The first one is this, buy gold. The church needed to buy spiritual gold that is purified in the fire, Jesus says. Remember, the city of Laodicea was a baking center and a manufacturing center, and they were extremely wealthy. Christ is teaching the church this. Their wealth is not true wealth. Just because you've got money in the bank, just because you've got real estate and land, just because you've got all these things, does not mean that you're wealthy. Because if your faith is not in me, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What they need is spiritual gold. What they need is spiritual wealth this morning. And I believe that what churches nowadays, the 21st century church, what we need is that spiritual wealth that Jesus wants to give to us. Gold represents the spiritual riches, all the riches and the inheritance offered by Jesus Christ. All the spiritual things that make life rich and overflowing. Things like love and joy, peace and goodness, faith, assurance, confidence, security, hope. All of these things you can't put a price on. In fact, if you were a billionaire, you still cannot buy joy. You can't buy peace. You can't buy happiness. The only place that you can get these things is from the Lord Jesus Christ with a right relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want true wealth that cannot be taken away from you, that you do not have to pay taxes on, that you don't have to file at the end of the year, if you want that true wealth, well, then you have to have a good fellowship, a relationship with Jesus. We need to buy gold from him. Now, I'm not condemning having a big bank account. Some of you may have a big bank account. There's nothing wrong with that. I never have, probably never will. Jesus does not allow me to have money because he knows I don't have enough sense to manage it. But I have spiritual wealth. I have a beautiful family. God has blessed me with a home. He's blessed me with a good job. Not so great boss. <laughs> I am living the dream. I, I have joy. I have happiness. I, I have confidence. I have assurance. I have faith. I know if I was to die today, I know where I'm going. I get to go spend eternity with my, with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and all of my family that's gone before me. I, I have all of that and not, not none of it. My joy and my happiness cannot be taken away from me by me. I am rich. Not in material goods, but I am rich in spiritual gold. And I hope that every single one of us here this morning can say the same. Buy of me gold, try in the fire, Jesus says. Not only that, but he says, buy a white raven from me. You need to buy a white raven. The church needed to buy a white clothing. Again, remember the city was a clothing center, a large textile and manufacturing center. 
Christ is telling them this. No matter how much clothing they manufacture, they lack the real clothing. What the church needs is spiritual clothing. Why? So the shame, their spiritual nakedness will not be exposed. This white clothing, this white raiment refers to the righteousness of Christ. The pure righteousness of Christ that makes a person acceptable to God. When we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, what happens to us is that there is a white robe given to us, and that white robe is the righteousness of Christ. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and our sinfulness, our, our, our shamefulness does not appear to God the Father. In fact, there is a wonderful illustration of this given in Zechariah chapter 3. If you were to read Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, I believe it is, there is the high priest Joshua is standing before God, and there are the accusers around, and he's got filthy garments on, and they're accusing him and saying, Look, he's done this and that and the other. And you know what God does? He ignores all of that, and he puts a white robe on Joshua, signifying that he has been forgiven of all of his sinfulness, forgiven of all of his unrighteousness, and now he is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's the same thing that you and I do when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus. In the book of Revelation, again, the Bible says that there is an accuser who is in the presence of God day and night accusing us. Every single day that rolls around, every night that rolls around, there is an accuser in the presence of God saying, you know what Jason did? You saw what he did yesterday. You saw those thoughts that went through his mind. You heard the words that come out of his mouth. You see what he didn't do or didn't say. I mean, you, he, he don't deserve to come to heaven. And you know what the Bible says that Jesus does? He just ignores all of it. And he clothes me with his righteousness. Paul put it this way. He made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that awesome this morning? If you're a child of God and we have a right relationship with God and we are in that fellowship with God, we can have that white raiment that Jesus is talking about. He counsels a church of way to see a look. Don't put your faith and your trust in your material goods. Put your faith and your trust in me. And I will clothe you with that white raiment. Jesus is asking them for a relationship. He's asking that church for fellowship. It's not about your bank account. It's not about your glory. It's about what I can give to you. And of the many things that I can give to you, the white raiment is one of them. I can make you righteous. You can't do it yourself. Paul, talking to the people of Rome in his letter, Romans chapter 10, he speaks of them going about being ignorant of God's righteousness and trying to establish their own tell you something this morning, Christian, there is no way that you can establish your own righteousness. Outside of the righteousness of Christ, you have nothing. You are poor, naked, miserable, blind. We need the righteousness of Christ this morning. So Jesus counsels the church to buy of him that white way. Not only that, but he, he says you need to buy me the eye salve. Buy eye salve for me. The church needed to buy eye salve. Remember, Again, the city was well known for its medical school that concentrated on treating the eyes with the famous eye salve. Christ is telling them that no matter how much they treat their eyes, they're still blind and in the dark. Why? Because they do not spiritually see the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They see only themselves. Only themselves. They saw little, if any, of Christ himself. They do not see their need for them, their nor did they see what his presence and his power could do for them in their church. And many churches are in the same condition. I mean, that they're blinded to the fact of what Jesus can do for them if they would just let him in. If they would just enter that fellowship with Jesus, that they would just buy gold of him and put their faith and trust in him and get that white raven. But instead, they remain blind as to the power that's available. They would just put their faith in their trust. They were blinded. The church of Laodicea were blinded to their own need and to Christ and the, the great difference he can make in their life. The eyesight means the God-given ability to see spiritual truth. 
They needed to depend upon Christ to give them the ability to see the light of the world. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine for them. Oh, Satan has blinded so many eyes, even in the church. Jesus says, why don't you buy eyes out for me? Let me anoint your eyes so that you may see. Remember the story that came to Jesus that was blind and Jesus made that eye staff out of the spittle and the, and the dirt and he put it on his eyes and told him to go down to the pool of Siloam and he went down and washed and he came back said, and how happy he was. He, he'd be given a brand new life. He'd never been able to see before, but on this particular day when he got that eyes out from Jesus, his life changed completely. The quality of life just shot through the roof. Same thing can be said of churches today. If we would just take the eyes out of Jesus and apply it to us and go to the pool of Siloam and wash it, we would come back so we would be given a new life. The church would be enlightened by Christ. Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, I condemn you because you're lukewarm, but that can be fixed. If you would just buy gold with me, try it in the fire. If you would buy a white raiment from me, that your nakedness be not uh, apparent to everyone. You know, speaking of that white raiment and the house after things, churches today spend too much try time trying to, trying to make their own raiment, their own eyes out. I'm reminded of Genesis chapter 3. You remember when Adam and Eve was there in the garden and, and Eve wanted to make an apple pie and so she went and got the forbidden fruit and was going to make an apple pie and Adam, being the man that he was, the glutton that he was, had to, all he needed was a scoop of ice cream and they ate the forbidden fruit and introduced sin. But you remember that's Brother Jason's revised paraphrase standard version. <laughs> you remember the story. They introduced sin into the world and when they entered, when they when they sinned, their eyes was open. But they, when, they, when they, their eyes was open, they saw that they were naked and they were ashamed of themselves. You know what they did? They sold fig leaves together. Now, I don't know what kind of fig trees they had back then, but I'm full of blood backwards. I don't know if there's a fig leaf alive that could cover up all my stuff. Amen? They sold fig leaves together, trying to hide their shamefulness, their nakedness, until God come in the garden. And he confronted them. He knew exactly what had happened. And the Bible says that God is the one who had to make them clothing. They could not cover up their own shamefulness. God had to do it for them. And that's what God is counseling the church of led us in. Buy of me gold tried in the fire, and white raiment, and that eye sap that you need. Let's move on to the final portion of the sermon this morning, which is the promise. We've looked at the condemnation. We have been, we've been beaten to death by the word of God. We've received a counsel from the word of God this morning. Now let's look at the promise that Jesus gives to those of us who are willing to take his counsel seriously and apply it to our lives. Look in verses 19 through 21. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and be with me. And him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Three things I want to share with you concerning the promise that Jesus has given to the church of Laodicea. The same promise that Jesus gives to the church of our day. The first is of chastisement. It may seem strange to you, but the chastening hand of the Lord is actually a blessing that gives us assurance that we are children of God. Jesus says that if he loves you, he will rebuke you. In fact, listen to what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now that is a fact. If you are a child of God, there is no way that you can go out and sin and live in disobedience to the Lord and not be chastened by God. 
if you're able to do that, well, then rest assured you are not a child of God. Because the Bible itself says, if you belong to me, God said, if you, if you belong to me, I will rebuke you. I will chasten you. Now listen as we'll go over in verse number 7. If you endure ch chastening, God did it with you as with sons. For well, what son is he whom it, the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Jesus says if you are never rebuked, if you're never chased, if you can just live your life any way that you want to live it and never feel my uh, chasing hand, well then you are indeed a bastard. The bastard simply means you are without a father. You are not my child. And so when the church is rebuked, when we are chastised, well, then that gives us the assurance. That is a blessing from God that reassures us that yes, obviously we do belong to God after all. Because if we're not rebuked, the then we are not part of God's kingdom. So he promises us chastisement. He also promises fellowship. What an awesome word picture Jesus gives us of a fellowship that is one day going to be ours. Just think, you're sitting in your easy chair and someone starts knocking on your door and you get up and answer and it's Jesus standing there wanting to come in and have dinner with you. Wouldn't that be awesome? But Jesus does that spiritually, you know. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone would open up to me, I will come in and sit with him and he with me. If you know it or not, Jesus is standing at the church's door and he's knocking. He wants to come in. He wants to bless the church. But the only way that he can come in that church is if we open the door to him. I shared this illustration with other churches that I've had the privilege of, of sharing the gospel with. A long time ago, we lived in a different town. My wife and I, we would cook supper for my family all the time. My mom and dad, they would be over there eating with us. And man, I, I just loved it. I loved my mom and dad to come eat supper with us. My sister would be there. But my older brother never would come. He never showed up. And so one day I asked him, how come he never came to our house and ate with us? Mom and daddy was there. My little sister was there. How come, how come you don't come? And, you, and what he told me has stuck with me ever since then. It's as big as my heart. It still breaks my heart today. You know what he said? He said, because you never invited me. You never invited me. I never opened the door to my brother. Well, I just naturally assumed that my brother knew that I wanted him there. Mom and dad was there. My little sister was there. Why would, he, why would I not want him there? But I never picked up the phone and said, hey, brother, why don't you come over and eat with us? And as a result, he never did. And he does now, occasionally. He lives a pretty good piece away now, but he still comes over with still a great way together. But during that time when we had opportunity, he never came over because I had never asked him to. The same is true with churches today. Jesus is standing at the door and is knocking. And many times we never open the door because we just naturally assume that Jesus knows that we want him to come in. That's not the case for us. We have to open the door. We have to open the door and let him in. The third and final piece of the promise is a throne. Jesus promises us a throne. A figurative expression meaning that we will share the privilege and the authority that Christ enjoys as we are be with him. There is coming a day when the people of God is not going to be in the minority anymore. We're not going to be down and trodden. We're not going to be made fun of anymore. But there's coming a day when we're going to get to sit in the throne and be with Jesus. Rule and reign with Jesus. What an awesome time that's going to be. The church of Laodicea had lost their zeal for the Lord. And there are many today who have lost their zeal for the Lord. May God help us to return to that zeal. And invite the Lord back in. To not be complacent anymore. Not to be lethargic anymore. I hope and pray that every single church in the world this morning would be willing to open the door for Christ to come in. Not just as a church, though, but 
present individual as well. You know, we as individuals can keep the door closed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We as individuals can be complacent. We can escape to the far country. Did you know that you can be sitting in a church pew this morning and be just as complacent and cold and lethargic, be just as far away from the Lord that, that he was in a home somewhere? It is possible. We as individuals need to open up the door. Jesus wants to come in. He wants to suffer. He loves you. He wants to bless you. But we have to open the door and allow him to come in. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said from the churches. He's not in folks. The rest is left up to us. Stand with me as we pray. Some of your musicians come. Lord, we confess to you this morning that there have been times in our lives as individuals and as a church where we were complacent, we were lethargic, we were trying to make it under our own steam. But Father, as we are convicted by your word this morning, we confess to you that we cannot continue on by ourselves. Father, we need your power, we need your presence in our churches, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our everyday life. Father, we know that you're standing at the door knocking. So we pray that you would give us the power to open that door up to you. Help us, Father, to surrender our lives to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Emma. Turn to number 800, please. 800. say thank you for allowing my family and I to be back with you guys this morning. It's always a privilege for us to be able to, to be here with you. So thank you for that. God bless you. Brother well, Jason, if you and your family are standing at the back door as everyone departs, they can acknowledge your presence here this morning. We appreciate you and your family being with us. Everybody please visit with them as you depart. We want to have a Bible study tonight at 6 p.m. This is first Sunday so we'll also have fellowship. We will dismiss by the reading of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but 